your minds. But some of these are losing three, four, five, six, seven, ten cubic feet per second. The creek just begins to dry out. Why that happens is of enormous interest to me. And notice that uh, some of the some of the creeks dry out in some studies. In other studies, they gained water. The same reach, different years. Why are they different? It's a fascinating question. Um, there are many factors at play in stream flow, and I think these studies are hugely influential. But they uh, they need more work. I'm, I'm very excited to look into the reasons why streams are beginning losing. This is the Deschutes River close up. This big red reach in here around Silver Spring is uh, frequently losing water. This is sort of neutral, neutral gaining, losing. A little bit of loss in some seasons, gain in others. But look at this, look at this. The upper reaches of the Deschutes River, yellow and orange the whole way. Now this upper reach of the Deschutes is fed mostly by forested land. But there are important agricultural practices up there, namely logging. Logging is a big deal. But it's conflated because there's also a bedrock underlay here. Bedrock doesn't soak up much water. It's got very low storage. So the two factors in my mind are, what's the role of land use in the upper Deschutes in influencing whether water is, is uh, draining out and gaining in the dry months? And what's the role of geology, hydrogeology? In that same process. The two compete with each other to some extent. Does volcanic activity with you know, shifting in plates and stuff, does that impact the groundwater permeability? I mean, you know, the, the till and stuff with the permeability because things are shifting? You mean, it's a very active area. Well, it is seismically active. Um, I've got my very last slide that I'll come well, to for that question. So, uh, September. Streams are just about at their low. We're at right at the end of the water year. And I'm right down here. I'm right down in here. This is September. Notice that many years we've got, we've got kind of low water levels at that particular gauge. So this is, this is when it starts to get a little squishy. Now, what can we do with all this data? <clears throat> well, first of all, we can map it. This is a raster image. That is, um, there's a data set called PRISM, run by the University of Oregon. It's a fantastic rainfall data set. Uh, we twisted and warped PRISM to match our gauges exactly in our area. So PRISM is what PRISM is. We twisted a little bit to match our known data sets. And lo and behold, you get 12 feet of rain in the Black Hills. Okay, 12 feet of rain and three feet of rain in yellow. Hmm. Look at the rain slope on our county. It's an enormous difference in rainfall. Now they fall in generally the same months, but the difference in rainfall is stunning, and it shows up in many ways. But we can take that rain, and we can add two other factors. One is land cover. This is another beautiful data set uh, published by the USDA called Cropscape. If you ever want to look at land use, Cropscape is a great place to start. So we take cropscape land cover with our precipitation and our geology. And this is the, um, the uh, geological surveys, superficial geologic map, the digital version. Um, great data set. This has been simplified by me in order to show hydrogeologic units uh, at a little more coarse scale than, uh, than just straight geology. Now, how do you go? from land use and rainfall to something that makes sense about <coughs> recharge. Because recharge is, it's a tricky thing. It involves soil moisture, it involves timing. What do you do with it? How do you use it? Well, it's a great study used by a lot of people in our area. The USGS did a study, two researchers, Bidlake and Payne, did a correlation between um, soil type, land cover, and recharge rate for the Kitsap Peninsula. And we're using that in our county because these studies are quite difficult. And I'd like to get one here, but so far this is the best we have. And this allows us, look, you can't even read this, but these gray blobs are, through significant data processing, the result of estimated recharge calculations for our county. Now these have one other factor added to them, wastewater. The assumption right now is that wastewater is happening in addition to whatever 
is happening with natural recharge. So, uh, I don't have time. I'm going to keep going. If we get a question about it, I'll come back to it. But we thought everything is fantastic. We're also running a big model. This is the numerical model simulation across almost all the county. I haven't quite got this little strip over here yet, but maybe that in the future. Um, this modeling is a very inexpensive way to get a lot of information pretty quickly. So we're running this model. It's uh, very helpful. It has helped us avoid drilling a lot of new wells. But we've got to calibrate this. So we're also drilling a monitoring well program. Uh, we've got about 40 wells, and we've got a whole bunch of new ones in the thinking stages right now. This is a sonic drilling rig, very fast. This driller is seven feet tall, I'm not kidding. Really tall guy, nice guy. I joke that if the machine breaks, he just pulls the rods out himself. Um, this is down in South County. So, and people need water, of course. So we started looking at the data sources in our county for human use as part of that court case, the Hearst case I mentioned. So people use sort of a baseline water use that I'm showing here. At about 50 gallons per day per person, people just don't use less than that. It's very difficult to get people to use less than that. Now, actual water use, total water use is up here. So the difference is what I'll call consumptive. This piece down here is going to go back into a septic system if it's a rural small home. This piece probably being sprayed on the lawn. But the, the difference between them is probably being sprayed on the lawn. That's an important distinction because I'm very interested in consumption. Now look at that. It looks like a child's bubble game or toy. But it represents our current estimate of the 22,288 pumping wells in our county with a flow rate associated with each annualized. Big compilation effort. Um, we're writing up the methodology used, but this allows us to model and calculate something like that. Now, let me tell you what this shows. This is cumulative annual withdrawals from wells. It's almost 80,000 acre feet per year. Here are, the, here are the categories. This is the Group A system wells. This is the, the big cities and towns. This is fish propagation. Enormous amount of water, the se second heaviest hitter in our county is fish. The third is irrigation. I would have thought that they'd be reversed, or irrigation might even be first, but it's not. These, this green bar, is 19,332 small, small wells that you saw in the last uh, slide. And we've got, uh, oh God, I can't even read it. Uh, industrial, commercial. Here we've got almost a thousand Group B public systems estimated here, and um, oh, these are commercial right here. At the very end, one to five hundred new wells installed per year that are subject to this new law that just came out. So this is a pretty interesting curve. You say to yourself, "Wait a minute, the public sector wells are only about, on average, say forty percent built into their water rights." So we're going to have to come up with twice that much water in the future. Where's it going to come from? Where's it going to come from? I, I really, I'm very interested to know. It's going to be a tricky question. So, um, currently the, the Thur Thurston County issues what's called a CAWA, a Certificate of Water Availability, to allow people to go and drill, well, I, we're not permitting wells, uh, but um, we allow them to hook up to a well if it's shown to provide a minimum flow rate and no contamination, either bacteriological or nitrate contamination. We have a sanitary code that governs that, but in order to occupy the home, they have to have a kawa for the house. Um, so other people play other roles. Ecology plays a big role in permitting the well. I have to be very careful about what I say about this process because it's shifting as a result of the new law that was just passed. So what happens to our water after we use it? These are most of the 54,000 septic systems known to exist in our county. It also includes some big septics and some massive recharge operations. 
for example, City of Tenino, lots recharging Hawks Prairie up there. And this is a close-up of the wastewater. I think it's fascinating to see where we um, put septic systems. Note that these lakes have a perennial problem with bacteria and algae. And they're also very close to large numbers of septic systems. Now, I'm not going to draw an immediate correlation there, although that might be what I just said, but it's not, uh, not, not what I want to imply. By the way, my thoughts are my own, not my counties. Um, okay, so how can we use these tools? Let's look at an area. This is Scatter Creek. In 1910, the graduating class of Rochester High School included women for the first time, and they took a photograph to commemorate the high school class, standing in a dry Scatter Creek. And the gentleman that, and the, his wife who live in that, and Dale Grohlke and his wife that live almost on the spot where the photo was taken from, can see the bridge that now exists. It's a modern bridge for, for the same road. Very cool. But it's dry. Now, that was either May or September, probably. It was dry. So we started looking. Are our creeks dry in that part of the county? And in fact, yes. The brown creeks here are creeks that were observed to be dry. And the little fish symbols are fish and wildlife estimates of where fish can live or may have been observed. I, I really like that. Notice the fish climbing the hill just south of Tenino. <laughs> I haven't figured out how they do that yet. <laughs> so is this going dry at any time of the year? Summer. Late summer. Okay. But there was a question about this that came up the other day. Okay, now, here, let, me, let me switch back and forth. A, B, A, B. A is the condition of the stream. B is all the pumping wells and the water rights for withdrawals of surface water along that set of creeks. But I'll be caution, I'll call, issue a cautionary note here. It is not a direct correlation that these are the causal agent behind the current condition of the creek. The gravel in that valley is so fast, hydraulic conductivity is so high that it may well simply achieve a low level that cannot sustain surface flow in the summer. So um, I would look at that and go, oh boy. But I'm not drawing any conclusions. I'm trying to maintain a scientific distance. I think that public policy has to be based on extremely rigorous science. So I want this to be out there. I want people to be talking about these kinds of conditions. But don't draw conclusions yet, please. Mm. Now, I will tell you that ecology stopped issuing permits for new water rights in 1950 for surface water withdrawal in that same valley. That's the valley you were just looking at. And then, by the late 50s, sorry, mid mid 50s, they closed off, well, they stopped issuing new water rights permits for surface withdrawals in a number of other basins, including the Yelm vicinity. And then, they stopped issuing permits for new water right withdrawals in most of the Chehalis Basin and expanded the area near Yelm. And then they decided that most of Thurston County could no longer be issued water rights for some usages. And uh, I'll, they refer to this as closed. I don't like that word because it's not true. They don't mean closed. What they mean are, is that there are limitations on when and how water can be used. But they felt there was enough evidence to issue rules, and there are now rules that are sort of the guidance for ecology's belief in how much water is available and what can be permitted. But we as a county, looking at the lay of the land here, have to do things like say, well, see each of these purple dots is a pumping well for a home, and these are big public supply wells or larger irrigation wells. If we allow a new home to be built here, will it affect or be affected by its neighbor's pumping? Will it? To the level of one molecule as determined by the State Supreme Court? <laughs> oh boy, I don't want to answer that question. Okay, so um, back to our minimum mainstream flow curve, the red line here. Um, what does it mean? And um, there's another way of statistically looking at the data set. Here I've mapped or displayed graphically a series of water years by water year Julian month which allows me to 
show things um, year on year. I'm going to show min, max, and plus or minus one standard deviation. So we come down here, and at this gauge, this is the Black River, um, you know, we're kind of spanning the range around the middle midstream flow line. So what are other places doing if they have water shortages? Well, they're setting up water banks. And I apologize, you can't read the numbers in the graph, but this is the cost of water. This is $100,000 per acre foot of consumption, 80,000, 60, 40, 30. This shows that most of the commercial and agricultural water banks are way up in the $40,000, $50,000 acre foot. The public water banks are much cheaper, um, but you know, the idea of setting up a water bank to help balance out the system is, is on my mind a lot. We've applied for a grant to look into that. Okay, climate change. I couldn't live without a climate change slide. We do have some data which shows increases in water temperature, and um, some of them appear to be statistically significant trends. Now, remember, if you want to heat up surface water or groundwater, it takes a lot of heat, a lot of heat, particularly groundwater. We have to heat up the earth matrix at the same time. Why does this trend exist? I don't know. But if any students are looking for data, we've got data, senior <laughs> thesis, master's thesis, dissertation, step forward, we can help you with data. I want all the students to know about the opportunity for data. Um, but as a geoscientist, I cannot look at this and look at that as the only possibility. You know, you've got things like geothermal sources, um, tectonic, volcanic sources. I think those are not happening here. But Nonetheless, you can't rule them out without some further study. So, end of show. Sort of on time. Sorry I talked so much. Thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll take uh, questions from the floor until 8 o'clock at the latest. And after that, um, if you still have questions,